Okay, everyone, uh, we're going to get this thing started here. I know um, we're, we're running a little bit behind here because uh, Harpoon's got another group coming through here that's going to be in the back of the, uh, back of the beer hall. So um, we'll get this uh, second part of the evening started. Um, first and foremost, I just wanted to thank uh, Mr. Dan Canary sitting to my left for opening his doors here to the beer hall. Um, th this has been fantastic. Uh, you guys didn't have to do this, but we really appreciate it, so thank you. Well, um, <laughs> you are more than welcome, Chris, and it's a great partnership, and I would say welcome to everybody on behalf of everyone, and all the employee owners here at Harpoon, and you know, thinking back 29 years ago, not only about this space and what it was like back then, but the idea that we have all these wonderful people in Boston who care about craft beer and are coming out at night to talk about it. I know there are thousands more. Is, you know, when I think back to what it was like when we started, it's awesome to be here with so many folks that are passionate about what we care so much about. This wouldn't have happened uh, 20 years ago, huh? No. Oh. So uh, the second half of our uh, talk this evening um, is perhaps what I think is uh, one of the most important, um, definitely the hottest topic right now in the craft beer industry, uh, which is sort of the M&A environment, environment for craft. Um, we've seen just a ton of deals happening uh, over the last 12 to 18 months. Uh, Harpoon, uh, among one of the breweries that has had to sort of navigate that exit strategy process um, and figure out what their next step was as a business. Um, and I think it's an important topic for every single brewery owner to consider at any stage, really, um, whether you just started up or whether you're considering an exit in the near future of your own. Um, having a succession plan is uh, incredibly vital to your business. So that's why I assembled uh, these three gentlemen up here to, to sort of talk about that. Dan, obviously, uh, will sort of uh, shed his uh, perspective on, on the ESOP route, the Employee Stock Ownership Program, which we can get a little bit more into. Um, to his left is Ted Clark from uh, Northeastern University. This is a guy who has spent his entire life uh, understanding the nuances of family businesses and uh, is a true expert on uh, this topic. So we're grateful to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, Derek Nemeth down, all the way down there. Uh, is a, uh, a private equity guy. Um, uh, I, might be, I might be botching that now. I might be confusing, <laughs> confusing my definitions of things. Uh, but he's also an angel investor uh, in a craft brewery and a strategic advisor to some craft breweries. Um, and he follows the space very closely, so he's got a pretty deep understanding of uh, just the deal environment in general and, and um, kind of how these transactions are taking place. Um, so uh, with that said, I kind of want to jump right into it. Um, you know, as I mentioned, all sorts of deals over the last 12 to 18 months. Um, just to run it down real quickly, uh, you know, we had private equity transactions with Sweetwater in Atlanta, uh, Southern Tier in New York, and Uinta. They all received at least minority investments in private equity. Um, not sure exactly of all the percentages on those uh, specifically, um, at least, you know, the ones that are, are public and not public. Um, there were some folks who went the strategic route, uh, you know, selling to a, another brewery. Blue Point, Ten Barrel, and Elysian all went to Anheuser Busch. Uh, Boulevard sold to Duval, um, and then you have more of the employee stock ownership program, which I guess everyone sort of points to Full Sail in New Belgium as the uh, uh, the examples of that in the craft space. But more recently, Harpoon and uh, a smaller chain of uh, restaurant breweries, the Ram uh, Brewery and Restaurants, they also went um, employee stock ownership as well. Um, and then you see, you know, more creative partnerships with uh, McKellar and Alesmith most recently announcing a joint venture, uh, Green Flash, small acquisition with uh, Alpine. Point being, uh, this stuff is, is happening uh, at, at a much more rapid pace than it ever has before. Um, so, you know, kind of wanted to pick your guys' brain on the whole broad topic of succession planning and exit strategies for craft brewers. Dan, let's start with you. Um, when you guys were going through the process of talking to bankers, talking to private equity, talking to all sorts of potential buyers, what ultimately led you to the ESOP? 
Well, um, you know, we looked at an ESOP for the first time just to educate ourselves maybe about three years ago, which was when Rich and I, we hit that 50-year mark and said, oh, wow, maybe we have to start thinking about a succession plan. You say people should do it. I think it's actually more natural that you don't do it because <laughs> you don't believe really that your business is going to be that successful. You're going to have to be concerned about it. It's a nice problem to have. But we said, you know, we need to start thinking about this. And so we looked at an ESOP about three years ago and then just over, you know, about a year and a half ago, uh, we, we talked again about it and Rich made it clear that he was open to a transaction looking for some liquidity. So we agreed, we'd had a great partnership, let's look at all the different options. So I was interested in ESOP, he was in, more interested in either a private equity or strategic sale. So we pursued both of those things. So I was able to present to the other shareholders and our outside, two outside directors um, the ideas for an ESOP and I met along with Rich with bankers and some private equity guys. And we decided on an ESOP because it's consistent with who we are as a company and what our future idea was for the business. You know, great thing about an ESOP, they're, they're not perfect. I'm not making that claim, but it doesn't work for every business. But for us, it provided the liquidity we needed. So we were able to get a, a good, fair valuation on this. There's a misconception, I believe, out there that if you go to an ES the ESOP route, you have to sell for less money. That's really not true. You go through a full and fair valuation process with an outside party that looks at all kinds of different comps that determine what the fair value of your business is. And that's, and that's a banker that's auditing it? That's right. So it's, you know, as you look at selling, you know, there are different ranges of prices, right? If you're selling to private a minority stake to a private equity, it's one value. Maybe it's an eight times multiple. If you're selling majority stake to private equity, maybe it's 10 times. If you're selling minority to strategic, it's 12. Majority to strategic, it's 14. Don't quote any of those numbers. I'm using them as an example. And these are all uh, EBITDA numbers? Or? Exactly, multiples of EBITDA. So if you go and you're selling a minority stake to an ESOP, it's considered a financial transaction, not a strategic transaction. So you're getting a comparable price to if you sold to private equity. So it provides you the liquidity at a fair price for your selling shareholders. It also provides you with continuity of management because we were all, most of us, six of the, seven of the eight people were staying involved in the business and then also provides you a framework for the future. The question is answered now for Harpoon about what we're going to do. We're not selling. Right. So for our wholesale partners, they don't have to worry, hey, next year we're going to be in the Anheuser-Busch network. So we're here. We've got a great group of employees. And for us, it, it felt right to share the future value that we're able to create as a business with our fellow employees rather than with anybody else. Per perpetuation was <clears throat> a little bit more of a uh, deciding factor for you guys then? Yes. So... Ted, uh, Dan mentioned that um, you know they didn't really s start considering this until about three and a half years ago, at least you know any kind of transaction. And then you know more recently, about a year and a half is when they really started exploring it. Is that pretty typical um, in in sort of uh, it, it ha what do you see when you're talking to family businesses? Do they typically wait towards uh, to a, a certain point in their business where they're you know, really starting to decide on this, or are people being more proactive with it from an earlier stage now? Yeah, the, the, what, what I would say is that people are uh, more reactive than, than not. They don't typically prepare, and uh, they don't typically have a, such a good result as we've seen here with Harpoon. More often than not, they, there's a scramble. Uh, they're not prepared to gear up with an ESOP, and being able to do an ESOP, it, and as was mentioned, it's not right for everyone, but when it works and it fits and it's in the culture, it's a great opportunity. But unless you have the employee base and the ownership base, it might not be appropriate for the smaller brewery and they need to plan further in advance. Otherwise, if they get into a situation and they're reacting, they won't extract the value for the business that they were hoping to get because they're, they're in a reactive mode. So they should plan more, but they don't typically plan. So what are the steps that a, <clears throat> a smaller or a younger uh, company should take if they're gonna start planning you know, for their future, whether that be some sale to uh, a larger strategic company or a private equity or, or just even a generational transfer to um, you know, somebody else in their family? Uh, well, one of the things that I, I heard tonight was that the passion for brewing. They have a passion for doing what they do and they love to do what they do. You need to develop the passion for the business. But then more importantly, I think as far as the owner of the business, you ne really need to make yourself irrelevant. So that if you, if you want to create a business that's transferred to another owner, you need to be able to not be there so that the new owner is able to, to run the business in a way that fits their new business. 
So you really need to plan to extract yourself, to have a good group of people around you, good employees, a good management team, and really have a professionally run business. Right. So planning for a new owner um, is, is an interesting point, and I'll kind of kick it to Derek, and, and maybe we can kind of you know, take a step back, um, go through some of the different types of buyers that are out there right now for craft brewers, and maybe briefly touch on the decisions that brewers make with regards to their brand strategy, with regards to their distribution strategy, and how that uh, will impact who they're able to sell to or what kind of transaction they're able to execute down the road. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to make a small correction. I'm actually not a private equity guy. I'm a private investor in a brewery. Um, <laughs> it's a big distinction I'd like, I'd like to make there. I've been, I've been in the space since 2002. And I literally just walked up to the bar at my favorite craft brewer in, in that year and just asked how I could get involved in the business because I had been in Europe prior to that and seen the, what, I, what is more like a craft beer culture there. And I believe that it would take in the United States and as we can see it, it has. Um, so I'm just a private investor um, in, in, a, in a craft brewery, not a private equity guy, but I do, I do a lot of analysis of, of the industry. And I mean, when we, when we talk about a strategic acquirer, what's interesting about this industry versus a lot of industries is the most likely strategic acquirers, which are in this case, Miller Coors and AB InBev are generally disliked, we could say nicely, yeah. um, by most of the craft community, um, which is rare in most industries. I've been in investments my entire career and uh, this is a unique uh, situation where you see two players that have 75% of the market share, um, which are you know, not the favored players. Even in the regular uh, beverage industry, non-alcoholic, there are a lot of different companies that have no problem selling to Coke. A lot of companies found their company so they can sell to Coke. You don't see that in, in, um, in the alcoholic well, in, in the craft beer business. So it's very interesting. And um, I think it, it, it creates a, an interesting dynamic that I, I like. I'm, I'm enjoying watching this whole thing play out. Um, it, but, but I mean, um, when, when brewery owners don't consider that that could be their new owner down the road, um, at least from day one, I mean, even with something as simple as a, a distribution strategy, you know, if you're mostly Miller Coors or mostly Anheuser-Busch, I mean, you're ruling out a buyer almost from day one, and they're not going to want to deal with the distribution footprint um, and, and, and changing that over. Um, well, I don't know how, how, how big of a deal that is, but, um, you know, I guess that presents some opportunities, obviously, to some other buyers so, or some other uh, transactions that can occur, whether it's ESOP, whether it's private equity, family office, management buyout, whatever it is, um, you know, certainly the way that you uh, approach the marketplace will change depending upon what your end goal is. Um, in, in, in all of your guys' experience, um, collective experience, you know, how did you guys approach those decisions along the way for you, Dan, and um, you know, some of the businesses that you work with, Ted? How do they approach those decisions? Um, and how does it kind of shape what the company is you know, up until that, that point of a deal actually happening? Well, you know, commenting a couple things with the Anheuser-Busch, Miller Coors, you know, Jim Cook has done the analysis on the percent of value for our brands that is actually in the wholesale tier versus what we own. And it's a, it's a, it's a surprisingly high number of that value is at the wholesale tier, which I think does affect the acquisition pricing. If, you, if someone was looking at buying, say Anheuser-Busch was looking at buying Sam Adams, which is primarily not on the AB network, there would be, think of the transaction costs of getting that brand over into the AB network. So that's going to drive down the value of, of Sam Adams for Anheuser-Busch. Um, another angle, so you were talking about earlier with private equity people coming into the industry, I think there's a difference between the family office folks, and you and I have talked about this, the family office folks and the private equity folks. Private equity, they have an absolute timeline. It's a sale in three to five years, and it's a sale to a strategic, or it's going public, because that's how they make their money. The, the family offices, it's not clear to me yet whether they need that. 
So that even though private equity, equity will tell you we're long-term partners and we're here forever as long as you want to be, typically that's not the case in my experience. But family offices, I've seen, we know one we talk about, they've been in for 10 plus years. Right. And that might be a, a little bit of a different twist, but now to get to answer your question, if we didn't, we weren't really planning to sell the company. So we didn't try to structure it any which way other than to run a good business so that we would have the resources to be able to do what we wanted to do. So if we hadn't made some of the decisions we'd made to hit some financial objectives, for example, we wouldn't have had the debt capacity that we had to do the ESOP. So the decisions do matter. Um, and if you don't make the right ones, all of a sudden you're not going to have the alternatives you have. So if we had been in a situation like, gee, you know, we hadn't been able to make money or we borrowed a lot of money to do something else three years ago and Rich came and said, I want to sell, we might have not been able to do the ESOP, we might have had to sell. So the, the real planning is, is really important and even though we didn't do much of it, um, we'd focus enough on the income statement and balance sheet to give ourselves some options when the time came. Dan, I know you said, you know, sort of from day one, uh, you and Rich both agreed uh, there was going to be no generational transfer, like it wasn't going to go to, you know, one person's kids or the other. Uh, so you kind of took that off the table, you took that piece uh, out of the game right from the get-go. Um, but Ted, I mean, there are, there's a big feeling in craft that remaining independent um, can somehow align with passing it down to your children. I know Ken Grossman at Sierra Nevada feels very strongly about this, you know, passing it down through his family. Um, in your experience sort of working with uh, businesses on generational transfers, um, what are the best ways that owners of businesses are setting themselves up for that? What are the challenges? What are the risks? Um, I imagine that there's going to be a lot more breweries that will consider that route as well. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we haven't really seen it, you know, actually transfer or change right. hands yet, but um, what will be the considerations when they do? I think as Dan said, to run the business, looking at the balance sheet, looking at the cash flow, look, run it like it's a business that somebody would actually want to acquire. If you set this thing up, a business, as if something somebody would want, it'll attract your children into the business. If your kids are coming into the business because they have this overwhelming um, pressure of legacy, think of the burden that puts on them. You should run the business as if it's a business and if it's something that they want to be drawn into because it's running well and they see an opportunity and they see a place for themselves, they'll, they'll nav naturally gravitate in. But if you're putting the burden on them, uh, what happened? Something happened with Anheuser-Busch and the... Uh, <laughs> but they made it four generations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, you know, when well, and there's plenty of brewery examples. I mean, look at the Yinglings oh, yeah. and the Mats. I mean, Absolutely. but I, I think more recent history, um, you know, Sierra will probably be the next one, I would imagine. Um, when the business is run well, the family will, will gravitate to it right. because they'll see an opportunity. But when it's not run well, they'll... It's also the other part of what you see very often is when the family's brought into it because of the legacy, Legacy is usually what people in the IT department think of as the stuff they want to get rid of, but they can't. <laughs> so legacy can have this great advantage of history and heritage, but it can also have this overwhelming burden of uh, I'm, I'm, I'm chained to this thing. And you shouldn't do that with your in my opinion, you shouldn't do that with your family. You should make your family see this great opportunity in a wonderful business that they'd enjoy working in because it's well run, it's professionally managed, and they see the opportunity of the business, not the burden of a legacy, but the opportunity of creating a legacy. And that's a key. Right. And that, that's where I've seen a lot of generational businesses have issues is when you hit the third and fourth generation. Because the first generation obviously is driven Second generation usually grew up with the business, so there's usually that carryover effect. And then you get to the third and fourth generation and they're like, wow, this is worth a lot of money. And it doesn't mean that much to me. So that's when they start to have issues. And if they don't have the right structures in place to take care of that, and obviously for craft beer, there are very few, well, I guess Yingling now is a craft beer. So uh, <laughs> now they're, they're talking about third and fourth generation and beyond but very few craft beer brewers who were founded in the 80s and 90s are worrying about the third and fourth generation. Eventually that will be an issue if they get to that point. Right, right. Um, when it comes to, I guess, actually setting out the criteria in what you want in a buyer, um, 
what's on the checklist for you, Dan? I mean, you, you guys talk to bankers. You guys talk to private equity guys. What were the pros and cons of each? How did you say yes? How did you say no to certain ones? What was it like sort of behind the scenes when you guys were talking about this amongst yourselves? I think, you know, at the end of the day, speaking for myself personally here as opposed to the rest of the folks involved at Harpoon, there had to be alignment of interests and objectives in the transaction. And so pretty quickly, you know, I, I, if my objective was not to simply maximize the amount of money that I made, well, then investment bankers aren't really that, in, they're not that interested in me. Which is kind of an, it was a, it was a fun conversation to have with them because I don't think they have too many conversations like that. But um, in private equity, when you, you know, you've, I've been around private equity folks for years and so if you kind of, I remember I was on a panel not that long ago with a private equity folk talking to, a, I think, a YPO group and saying, well, we will, t we will take minority stakes and we'll let you run your business. And I just said, but correct me if I'm wrong, but you'll just have two small caveats, right? You can tell them when to sell the company and you can fire the CEO. Other than those two little things, go ahead and run your business any way you want. So <laughs> for me, there was not alignment with those folks. So at the end of the day, it kind of came down to what do we want to do with our business and we wanted to stay independent. And the best way for us to do that is, was to do what we did. I think, again, the other people, if, they're, if you're unsophisticated in, in and about the financial markets, people will come in and really tell you they'll find out pretty quickly what they think you want to hear. And they'll tell you that. And I certainly have had a lot of friends, my great friend Alan Newman, <laughs> but anyone wants to talk to someone in craft brewing who has great experience dealing with different financial transactions, talk to Alan Newman. But once you sell your company, you sell your company, period. It's not your company anymore. So understand that going into it. And the only way for us to keep control of this thing was to do what we did, which was to sell it to our employees and to remain independent. That was the alignment of interests that we were looking for. And as we kept going back at it and back at it and back at it, this was the answer that kept coming to the front. Why wasn't the, the multiple uh, a bigger part of your decision? Because, uh, I mean, you got... You, you I wasn't selling. I was not interested in selling. So I had, to, I had to get a multiple that Rich was comfortable with. And he and I had that conversation. And that's one of the reasons we did the research we did talking to bankers and private equity guys to get a sense of what they were willing to pay for a minority stake in the company. Could you have gotten more for Harpoon? If we were willing to sell to a strategic, absolutely. And that wasn't something you were willing to do? That's right. But, it, but and, and, and right now the ESOP valuations are based on what's going on in the industry. And in the industry you have Sam Adams trading at 50 times earnings, Craft Brewers Alliance trading at almost 80 times earnings, we didn't quite get that. No, no, no. I know. <laughs> I, wish, I wish you had. No, um, I you'd have bought all the rounds this tonight, right? Um, that affects the valuation that the ESOP gets. So the, the ESOPs right now for craft brewers are better than you'd get in some other industries, but they're certainly, you know, Dan could have done a much better, much better as, as far as just getting a, a number that's higher if he had gone a different path. Um, but yeah, the ESOP right now is, is, is a favorable valuation um, versus other industries. Right. So we, we sort of outlined a few uh, different options, you know, private equity. I mean, we've seen brewers go all, all sorts of different routes. I'd, I'd be curious to kind of hear from all of you where you think um, the industry will trend uh, going forward. Will we see uh, more private equity deals? Will we see more strategic deals? Obviously, AB's been on a buying spree. Um, will we start to see some sort of, uh, maybe something we haven't seen before, some sort of creative partnerships or, um, I don't know if it's a generational transfer or some kind of variation of that, maybe management buyout, something. Um, where will these deals trend uh, over the next 12 to 18 months if you guys were just looking into a crystal ball? I'm looking at you, Derek. I, I think there'll be more of them. Um, and that's just because of the nature of the business. It's a commodity business. And right now we're in an expansion phase. But if you look at the Brewers Association graph of the number of breweries in the country over time, I think the graph goes back to 1876. 
and it starts at a really high point and it goes down and then you hit prohibition and it goes to zero and then it gradually grows but then from the mid 40s to the 80s it consolidated again I mean the nature of this business is a scale business these guys I mean and Dan can speak to this it's very capital intensive you have to spend a lot of money to make beer um, and a lot of these guys have to take on debt to do it so scale matters and it's important um, this business will this industry will get back to consolidation eventually it spent most of its time in the United States in consolidation so yeah I, I, I think there will be more deals I think I don't Totally speculating, I don't think AB InBev will do 50 deals. It'll probably be somewhere under 10, but that's just totally my opinion. Um, but there are some other interesting things that are going on that are not that sort of deal. And uh, I would recommend if somebody's thinking about this sort of thing, they should come talk to me. <laughs> I definitely have some, uh, some things to say about it, and I'm, and, I'm, and I'm open to having a beer and having a face-to-face -face discussion. So. Ted, in, in industries that have consolidated that you've seen, um, what's been the impact on the industry at large, you know, when, when an industry uh, consolidates, you know, sort of like Derek was saying? I, I think the ones that are prepared for it will do better than the ones that aren't prepared for it. The ones that aren't prepared for it will end up scratching their head. What happened? This is a scale business, I believe. And the ones that aren't prepared to scale up will wonder what happened and why they were left in the dust. They just won't be able to compete. They won't be able to put the money into the get distribution, to do branding, to do product development, to do marketing. They won't be able to get good prices for their products, and, and they'll, they'll struggle. So sooner or later, they'll, something will happen. I, I like to say I can predict the future, and I, I can for, for all businesses. Sooner or later, one of three things happens to all businesses. It either shuts down, there's a sale, or there's some type of a succession. So they're all looking forward to one of those th the three S's. And if they're prepared, they'll, they'll fare better than if they're not prepared. Um, we, all, we know of breweries that are talking to, um, to be looking at being sold. We know breweries that are considering ESOPs because they've talked to us about it. I know when we were going through our process last year, the investment bankers, there are tons, a number of foreign breweries, Japanese breweries, other foreign breweries who are dying to get into this space. So yes to all of your questions. I think there's gonna be more of everything. Um, I know people working with private equity ex-craft brewers who are looking to a roll-up strategy to go out and acquire two, three, four, or five craft breweries and then consolidate back office, whatever they can, and then take the public. The, you know, I was talking to someone earlier today Will about this. Will that be this. successful? It could be. It, that all depends on what the public markets are doing. Again, the, the private equity model is prefaced on the ability to sell it to someone at a higher price. It's either strategic or it's the public markets. Public markets are, are record highs right now. Strategic values are at record highs. Everyone's a genius right now because craft beer, everyone's making money. <laughs> so as long as that music keeps playing, Everyone's great, but I'll remind people, we have a, a story here at Harpoon in 1996, Catamount Brewing Company up in White River Junction, Vermont, borrowed $4 million and built a new brewery in Windsor, Vermont that they opened in 1996 that we purchased from their bank for $1 million in 2000. So when that music stops, the music really stops. So you just purchased the brewery or did you purchase the land, Everything. the real estate? We purchased the entire company including their brewery, all their equipment for, mil for 25 cents on the dollar. So there are going to be a, a, lot, a lot more deals are in the works right now, and I think a lot will work, but again, it depends how long that music keeps going. What will the uh, immediate impact be on players in the space that, that don't do a deal, that remain independent um, when, when AB buys another brewery What's the impact on the independent guys that have to go out there and compete with them? Well, you know, we've been at this a long time. I mean, AB, a they're, they're a terrific competitor. They do an awful lot of things really well. I have tremendous ad admiration and respect for those guys. But they have to compete in the street like we all do. And this is one of the great things about the beer business, in my opinion, craft beer especially, is it's still a relationship business. So, you know, we have our own distribution operation here in Boston. We have personal relationships with a thousand accounts. That really matters. It's a wonderful part of our business. So they can 
we've been competing really hard against a lot of bigger companies for a long time. I think the one thing we're seeing now with AB and Cra you know, for, is they're buying like Goose Island, the price cutting with some of these craft brands that they acquire. That's kind of a newer thing that they're doing is they're just, they're trading on that name that, hey, most people still consider this craft, but they're coming in and cutting the pricing on the kegs, for example, dramatically to try to really go after, you know, the independent craft brewers. So that's something, but you know what? We'll deal with that too, so. Derek, what do you think will be the ramifications of uh, more deals in the space? I mean, more private equity money coming in, more strategic uh, involvement in craft. Yeah, I, th I, 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 I agree with what Dan's saying. It's, it's definitely gonna become much more competitive because the space is becoming more professional than it's ever been. I remember the first Brewbound session that I ever went to. Uh, <laughs> Please don't bring it up. <laughs> one, one of the craft brewers, I won't mention any names, was talking about um, smoking dope. Um, you're going to see less and less of that as we go forward. Um, uh -huh. <laughs> no, it wasn't you. <laughs> Um, Derek, you're, you're assuming that we don't get into the marijuana business. <laughs> no, no, it's not it's a, a, grow, it's a growing evil. industry. It's not a statement on uh, Brewbound, but, uh, but this whole, no. I mean, <laughs> craft beer is now becoming more of a business than it's ever been. And when you, I mean, Schlafly is a great example. Right. Schlafly, it was sold to a private equity group in 2012, Sage Capital, and they just, they just cycled out the founder CEO. Yep. And they're bringing in a guy who was an AB InBev, Labatt's um, professional for and years AB, and years. Yeah. Now they're going to become very aggressive, and that's going to change the whole dynamic in that region. Right. That's, that's my opinion. Um, yeah. I think that is, that is something that the craft brewers should at least be cognizant of that going on because it's going to affect their businesses. So uh, I, know, I, I, know we gotta, I know we got to wrap things up here. I know there's another group that... Uh, came in to enjoy the space as well. I don't want to cut into their time. Um, you know, sort of final word on the importance of succession planning. Um, you know, you guys obviously see it. You saw it personally with yourself and your business. Um, just how important is it for brewers to be considering this right now, not five years from now? At least some kind of plan, whether it's a skeleton plan um, just how critical is it for their business and the success of their business going forward? And you know, what's one piece of advice you would offer business owners right now in the space if they're uh, you know, kind of looking at their long-term strategy? If you're, again, I think it's driven more where you are in your life in a sense than, than as opposed to your business. Again, we were hitting that 50, 55 time frame. It certainly was on the mind of our employees and so it's something we should have addressed and so it's appropriate for us to do so. If you're you know, 27 years old and just starting out and you're, you know, you're struggling to be successful and establish your business, I don't necessarily think you should be focusing too much in succession plan. So it's more the life cycle of your business. As I said earlier, I think running your business well as a business gives you the greatest amount of flexibility when you do approach those succession issues. I agree with that. I'd, I'd add one part, one part to that. I, advice I give to every business is to have a board of advisors. Get an outside group of people that you can rely on to provide you solid business advice, uh, industry advice, financial advice, so that you can professionalize your business. And having a sounding board will help you make sure that you're not missing opportunities and that you're planning as those life cycles change in your personal life and the business, you're, you're prepared to deal with them. Pe so a board of advisors. People that will disagree with you. And, and they're willing to tell you so, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Not people that you're paying on the payroll. You know, get, get good outside advice somebody that's not beholden to you financially. Derek? I, I think if you're at the point where you are maybe in your f late 40s or early 50s and you're a, a pioneer as, as, Dan, as Dan is, um, I think valuation-wise, we're kind of at a pretty high point right now. And that, that is, that's economics-driven and industry-driven. I would say if I had to guess five to 10 years from now, the valuations for an ESOP, for a private equity deal, for the public markets, for craft brewers, will all be lower than they are now. Just because it's so competitive and there's so many new entrants, the economics say that that's what's gonna happen. Awesome. Well, um, I, I know there are probably some people who have some questions. Pick these guys' brains uh, for the next hour or so while we enjoy some beers. Uh, thank you all for coming out.
Big round of applause for Harpoon for hosting, all our speakers. Um, and, and I did want to give a, uh, before we sign off here, I did want to give a quick shout out to our sponsors that uh, help make this event possible. Um, we have crews on the east and west coast and uh, you know, we bring in the AV and everything else. So uh, we wouldn't be able to do this without our sponsors, Owens, Illinois, Raring Pacific and Vicinity Brew listed up there. I don't know if any of those folks are here tonight, but if they are, seek them out and say hello. If not, uh, we hope to maybe see you at one of our events in the future. We'll be in Chicago on June 11th for our full day conference talking about all kinds of stuff like this. Um, there should be some promotional materials floating around. Uh, let's get some beers. Thank you.